Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, examining October 7th, the IDF admits it wasn't ready and failed to deal with Hamas's brutal surprise attack. Avi Abelo from PulseofIsrael.com pushing back on jihadist misinformation. And one man's promise to his son, now a hostage, that he would never support a swap of hostages for prisoners. And Israeli cowboys on the Golan Heights, facing new challenges brought about by the Hezbollah missiles overhead. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The pressure is building as Israel continues its multi-front war with Hamas fighters moving from place to place in Gaza and Hezbollah shooting missiles into northern Israel on a daily basis. Here's the latest followed by comments by CBN President Gordon Robertson. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant reported the IDF achievements to the Knesset after nine months of fighting. We eliminated or wounded 60% of the Hamas terrorists. We disbanded the 24 battalions, or the vast majority of them. We've returned half of the hostages and we're determined to return the rest. Hamas fighters are moving from place to place inside Gaza, forcing the IDF to re-enter places like Gaza City while urging civilians to evacuate. We want to get civilians out of harm's way. We have no interest in harming civilians in Gaza City or anywhere else. On Israel's northern border, Hezbollah continues to fire drones, missiles and rockets into northern Israel. This week, Hezbollah released a video showing its surveillance of Israel's military sites in northern Israel, including Iron Dome installations. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah says it will stop its attacks if Israel agrees to a ceasefire with Hamas, but with a condition. If the Israelis want to continue and attack southern Lebanon, then we will also defend Lebanon, south Lebanon, our people and our dignity. After thousands of Hezbollah rockets and missiles, most of the communities next to the Lebanese border stand nearly empty. We're about 200 meters, maybe about 600 feet from the Lebanese border. We're in Kibbutz Malkia, once a thriving agricultural community, but now like dozens of other communities on the Israeli-Lebanese border, mainly deserted. And most of its residents scattered throughout all of Israel. We sat down with the Thai Croys, the head of Kibbutz Malkia and the grandson of Holocaust survivors. We are standing in, in, with our back to the wall. For us, it's a war of uh, surviving. We have no other place. It's a small country. We, we cannot go to another place inside Israel or from outside Israel. So we have no choice. We have to fight for our lives. Croys warns his kibbutz and Israel stand on the front lines of a global war. It's not our personal war. Tomorrow it can happen everywhere. It means that if we will not stop this terror and these attacks in, in, in the Middle East, it can happen everywhere. All, all this uh, fundamentalistic organization that build themselves an army and they say we, are want, we want to conquer the world and make the world Muslim with power, can happen in France, it can happen in the USA. We saw what happened in the universities in New York. At the NATO summit in Washington, Israel's foreign minister called on member states to take strong action against Iran, which sponsors both Hezbollah and Hamas. Israel Katz tweeted, Iran is a common threat to Israel, NATO and to Europe. We must stop Iran now before it's too late. Now more than ever, it's time for what we've always called the free world, the Western democracies to stand in solidarity with Israel. This is a terror threat, and it's based on ideology that is fundamentally flawed and from a moral standpoint, absolutely wrong. What Hezbollah and, and Hamas want to do is wipe Israel off the map. They want to kill every single Jew. That is a call to genocide. That's a call to jihad. 
that is a call that is resonating right now within the fundamentalist Muslim community. That idea has to be defeated, and the way you do that is to say, we won't give on this. We will, if you attack Israel, if you say you're going to repeat October 7 again and again and again, well, then you cannot exist. This has to stop. So if you want to fire rockets into Israel from southern Lebanon, that has to stop. If you want to launch terror attacks in Israel, that has to stop. If you want to launch attacks from Gaza, that has to stop. And you can't have any equivocation. There needs to be unity here that no, we want peace in the Middle East. We don't want this continual violence and continual threat against Israel. Israel was established by international law, by UN mandate. That needs to be held together by the UN and by the world community, and especially the United States and Europe, aligned together to say, not on our watch, you don't get to do this. In a meeting with evacuated residents of Kibbutz Be'eri, the IDF admitted that it failed to protect them on October 7th. They also commended the community security team for protecting the kibbutz and preventing the terrorist invasion from spreading further. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. The Israeli military released a report on its own conduct and failures at Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th, including a diagram of the battle. That day, the IDF failed in its mission to protect the citizens of Israel. The area was one of the communities hardest hit by Hamas, with more than 100 Israelis slaughtered and more than 30 hostages taken that day, including 11 still in captivity. We were not prepared for the murderous terrorist attack by Hamas, involving thousands of terrorists who infiltrated the country at dozens of points at the same time and began a campaign of killing, slaughter and kidnapping in the southern settlements and IDF outposts. Terrorists killed Meir Zerbiv's brother and sister. He's furious with the IDF for not quickly charging into the kibbutz to stop the slaughter. The terrorists broke into the kibbutz at 6.30 in the morning and around, I think, 10 to 10.30, forces arrived at the entrance of the kibbutz and they were asked to enter. They didn't want to enter. They said they weren't given the order to enter. Israel's prime minister has rejected an official probe into October 7th while a war is going on. But this week, his own defense minister called for just such an investigation. We require a probe at the national level, a probe that will clarify the facts. It needs to check me, Minister of Defense. It needs to check the Prime Minister. As for the war in Gaza, the Washington Post reports both Hamas and Israel have agreed to the broad outline of a hostage release and ceasefire deal. But many details still need to be worked out. At a news conference, Joe Biden revealed he and American negotiators are heavily involved. And I'm determined to get this deal done and bring an end to this war, which should end now. Biden also criticized the Israeli war cabinet as too conservative and repeated his stance that the only way to a lasting peace is by creating a Palestinian state, something Netanyahu and the majority of the Israeli people are against. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, Avi Abelo from PulseofIsrael.com encouraging news watchers to seek the truth beyond the headlines. Through his website, PulseofIsrael.com, Avi Abelo seeks to amplify the truth about what's happening in Israel and help people do what he describes as cut through the noise. He stopped by our studio the other day and explained what he means by that. Avi Abelo, great to be with you. You're the founder and CEO of Pulse of Israel. First of all, tell us what the Pulse of Israel is. It's a daily media program. We're on the front line of the media war for Israel, and I provide on a daily basis really a, a belief-based, inspiring, politically incorrect truth to help understand daily events, current events about Israel, the Jewish people, the freedom-loving world. Yeah, there really is a media war going on right now, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And how do you see yourself plugging that gap, in a sense? 
I'm all about being on the offense. I'm all about inspiring people to understand the truth of what's going on, to understand beyond the headlines, because it's, it's first of all, we're being lied to every day by the headlines of the establishment media, and it's very depressing. Uh, so I provide beyond. I provide we should be proud. The Jewish people, we're back in our ancestral homeland. This whole narrative called Palestine and Palestinians, it's one big lie. It's one big blood libel. It's the biggest blood libel against Jews in all of history. Like, why else are Jews who have nothing to do with Israel being attacked if they live in New York, Los Angeles, France, London, or on college campuses because of a cause called Palestine? It's like, it, it, it has nothing to do with what's going on in Israel. It's because it's an anti-Semitic blood libel. And all for a people that didn't exist, because you go back before the 1940s, and you go back to the archive of the media, we're in the media, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, everyone, go Google the New York Times before 1948, right? Every reference to Palestinian referred to the Jews. So it's a made-up people. There's, it's not a historic people with a historic claim to the Jewish homeland. God gave the Jewish people the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a time where spirituality and, which, and, and, and realism is coming together. Because up until now, everyone's been talking about, oh my God, the Jews have to get out of the land and get out of Judea and Samaria and get out of Gaza. Now all of a sudden people are realizing, oh my God, the Jews can never leave Judea and Samaria. The Jews can never leave Gaza, historic Jewish lands. That It's not just because God gave it to us, but that's the only way we could provide security to the Jewish people. So we're seeing a fusion of spirituality and reality yeah. for the first time in our lives. You had a conference recently, and I'm sure people can Google that as well and see it online, and you presented a five-point plan for Israel. What's that? Yeah, very quickly, I believe the future of the Jewish people is bright and optimistic, and we're, we're in Geula, redemption times, and we're, we're on the front seat of redemption, all the Jews living here, and everyone who's living here together with us, like you, Chris. And the five-point plan is simple. Number one, we have to win this war. We have to end all the terror capabilities of our enemies that surround us. In Judea and Samaria, Gaza, Lebanon, Iran, and all their proxies around us, that has to be finished. That's point number one. Point number two, after that, we have to apply sovereignty in our ancestral homeland. Judea and Samaria and Gaza finally needs Israeli sovereignty under the Jewish state. Only then can we provide protection to all Jews and non-Jews who understand how blessed they are to live with us and to ensure we get rid of all the terror elements in our midst. Number three, all those that believe, meaning of our enemies who live amongst us, who believe in killing us and destroying the Jewish state of Israel, well, integrate. They, no, they shouldn't be living here. They, they want to destroy us and kill Jews? Well, don't live here. Live in a country that you agree with their ideology. Go live in Iran. Go live in Iraq. Go live in Egypt. Don't live here. And then those Arab Muslims who do understand how blessed they are to live in Israel and they're against terror and killing Jews and destroying Israel, they get citizenship to be able to live mm -hmm. in the Jewish state of Israel and Judea and Samaria and Gaza. That's a tiny minority of them because most of them under, are, are, are jihadists and, and uh, from the Islamic world and Muslim Brotherhood or Shiite, the world from Iran that want to destroy us. But there is a tiny minority, so let them have citizenship to mm -hmm. live here with us. And then number five is the most important because we can't have a, a positive future without number five. And that is Israel finally applies true sovereignty for freedom of all to pray on the Temple Mount. We end the intolerance and terror of the Muslim world that Jewish leadership and Israeli leadership are afraid of us applying true sovereignty on our holiest site of the world, where even our prophets and Isaiah was clear that all nations of the world will one day come and pray on the Temple Mount, where today we are appeasing the beast of the Islamic world. Well, that just appeases the beast to allow it to continue to terrorize us. So the only way, the linchpin of achieving true peace is the Jewish state of Israel finally applying true sovereignty on the Temple Mount, where Jews are allowed to pray, Christians are allowed to pray, Muslims are allowed to pray, but they have no uh, veto power and mm -hmm. threat of World War III. We're already at World War III without us having the ability to pray properly and have a synagogue on the Temple Mount. So when we finally stand up to the intolerance and terror of the Muslim world and allow freedom of religion on the Jewish holy site, that is when we're truly mm -hmm. going to be able to have a peaceful future. So it was a five-point plan. Great message. Avi uh, Abelo, great to be with you. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Coming up, how one man took action when his son was taken captive and helped create the Tikva, or Hope Forum.
While many families of hostages held in Gaza want the government to negotiate with Hamas for their release, other families want the focus to remain on eliminating the terror group. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. As a security guard at the Nova Festival, Eitan Moore saved many people before Hamas terrorists kidnapped him. He just celebrated his 24th birthday in captivity. Eitan is a year. He, he could escape, but he chose to, to help people, to save people. Eitan's father, Svika Moore, tells CBN News they've received two reports from Israeli intelligence that his son is alive. One before the first deal in the first 50 days after October 7, and the other one was from one of the hostages who was released. Uh, he said to the intelligence that he saw Eitan in a tunnel and they sat together and speak. Shortly after October 7th, Moore felt the need to support a strong military effort rather than a deal with Hamas for the return of his son and other hostages. That's why he helped start the Tikva, or Hope Forum. We were here in Shalit deal, that crazy deal, and we think that God gave us this role to stop and to save the people of Israel from another crazy deal. IDF soldier Gilad Shalit, kidnapped by terrorists in 2006, gained his freedom five years later in exchange for the release of more than a thousand, mostly Palestinian and some Israeli Arab prisoners. Included in that group, Yehye Sinwar, the Hamas leader in Gaza and mastermind of the October 7th assault. Only one terrorist enough to make October 7, as we saw. So that's the reason that we established Tikva Forum, because we have a different values and messages from the other uh, families. Ironically, months before the assault, Eitan and his father talked during a Shabbat meal about the deal leading to Gilad Shalit's release. Eitan told us that if he will be a hostage, he don't allow us to release him for terrorists. Dozens of hostages' relatives make up the Tikva Forum. Their motto? Only pressure Hamas for the release of the hostages, not the government. Israel must defeat Hamas, not only for the hostages, but for the other people of Israel, from the seven million and a half Jews here in the state of Israel. Moore gave prime examples from the 70s where Israel rescued hostages instead of making deals. They included high-profile events like the hijacking that led to the Entebbe raid, the PLO's attack of Tel Aviv's Savoy Hotel, and the attack and kidnapping of children on a field trip in northern Israel. Even so, he doesn't believe all the hostages can be rescued in an operation like we saw in early June. But Israel can press Hamas. Look, today we were giving Hamas a crazy humanitarian aid. It's not only bread and water, it's cigarettes and candies and pastries and everything. We can see all the, the markets in, in Gaza. So we have to make a crisis in Gaza. If we want to get our loved ones, I want them to, to beg us for, for a half, half cup of water and after they will give us our hostages, we have to continue to crush the Hamas. And he adds Israel must stay in Gaza and eventually resettle there, because if not, Hamas will only reorganize. They have only one target, destroying Israel. God gave us this country, and this coastline is our, like Tel Aviv, is our land. So we don't have to be shame. This is our only state on the globe. Moore says it's all about the future of Israel, and that's what the Tikva Forum is. You must support the state of Israel, and especially Tikva Forum, because as hostages families, we are in the front of the war. I lost my job since October 7, and I'm a father of eight kids. He says America must stand with Israel for America's own good. We are fighting your war. These barbarians are on the way to Europe and to America. If you want to live, you have to stand with us. You have to help us to crush them here before they're coming to America. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kfaretzion, Judea and Samaria. 
still ahead, cowboys and the Golan Heights wrangling forest fires as well as cattle. While it's often said that a cowboy's life is hard, it doesn't usually involve rounding up cattle, cattle in a war zone. However, in the north of Israel, it's a different story. Take a look. Cowboys in the Golan Heights are used to the blazing heat of summer and the sound of jets overhead. But this year, they and the cattle face new hardships, missile strikes. Before the war, there were military drills here. The cows are relatively used to explosions and to the stress in the field. But now we are carrying out pregnancy tests to check if indeed there is a problem here because of the strikes. The increased attacks from Hezbollah have also resulted in a new constant threat, forest fires ignited by falling shrapnel. So far this season, 15,000 acres in the Golan Heights have burned. Fields are being burnt, which are the grasslands for cows, and after that we don't have anything to give them to eat. We hope that this will end fast. These wars are not for us. We are working people. Let us tend cows. Let us ride horses in the field. This is the good life. As for now, we live in uncertainty because the situation at the moment is very fragile. You don't know if the war will continue or won't continue, if today there will be a barrage or there won't be a barrage. You don't know where this is going. We really are trying to plan in the short term, but also in the long term, but all with uncertainty. The cowboys have had to rely on each other to deal with the impromptu infernos. Often the firefighters cannot get there quickly enough. That puts Israel's domestic beef supply at great risk. There's a lot of mutual help. In each fire like this, everybody joins and comes to help with putting the fire out. This is our luck because alone we wouldn't be able to defeat it. For now, that teamwork might be all the Golan Cowboys can count on to get themselves and the cattle through this unusual summer. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. You can also keep in touch by signing up for our email blasts and please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the protection of all Israel. Let's all lift up IDF soldiers in our prayers and all those caught in harm's way. And may God make a way for the hostages to come home. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.